centre? Well, I just thought that call centres would just be full of young people, you know, like young students. Mm. When I was at school in Hull, I never sat there and I thought, do you know what I want to be when I leave school? A call centre worker. <laughs> I am afraid that some of the younger people these days live in a little bit of a bubble. Mm. And they're always going on about what they're going to do when they retire. And I'm just like, you're never going to retire. And, and what are people phoning to, to, to talk to you about? To complain. You're like, you're like a politician. You know? <laughs> so you have to say stuff like, I am so, so sorry. Well, we've never had that problem before. Yeah. I think my work in life contributes to making life worse. Um, little, actually, genuinely very little. But they do have free Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> my life as a call centre worker. Part one in the four-part well-read film series on work. So, to begin, Susan, can you just tell us a little bit about your job? Yeah, I work in a call centre, so it's just basically customer services. Mm. I answer the phone, try and sort things out, and um, input, like, from the phone calls, I have to input data accurately onto a computer system. Uh, just sit at a desk all day, really, set headphones on. I do have a little microphone, though, and I just, like, take call after call after call. And when you're ready for the next call, I've got to press the button really quickly. I know. So I can do that for about 40 hours a week. It's a bit too much, mm. really. And a normal shift normally lasts about nine and a quarter hours. And, and what are people phoning to, to, to talk to you about? To complain. <laughs> Mostly, or...? Well, I'd say about 30% of the calls are taking orders. So for example, someone phoned up who wasn't computer literate, um, we'd have to place the order for them. Or someone who didn't know where the order was, we'd just chase it up. But it does mostly feel like complaints all the time. But actually in reality it's probably not that bad. So can you tell us a little bit about the physical environment in which you work? Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice modern building. Hmm. Lots of natural light. There's a huge window above us and most of the walls are windows. And it's, hmm. it's lovely. Uh, there's lots of greenery outside, which is great. You can see it and it's really lovely, but it's a bit of a tease as well because it's like you can't go sit outside in that greenery under the sun and enjoy yourself. <laughs> um, it's all open plan. It's about a thousand people all sitting on rows of open tables. So you just see row after row after row after row after row. And in my section, there's about 400 people. About 80% of them are women. And do you have any privacy? No. Nope. <laughs> um, uh, does the job get boring or tiring? Or Yeah, I mean, you do get breaks, but it, the majority of the time you're just sitting. So, for example, say, if you flew from Dubai to Melbourne, it would be about 15 hours mm -hmm. just sitting. That's basically what it's like. So tell me a little bit more about the phone calls themselves. Well, you are timed and you do get stats. And, you know, if you're taking too long, you'll probably get called upon this. So you've got to be quick. You've got to take a call, record the call, take the next call and so on. Um, so there's call work and then after call work. Right, and does the company record the calls? Oh, every single one. Um, if you're taking too long, they probably listen to you more. But, I mean, to be honest, you could be on the phone for like 50 minutes if you're dealing with a really bad complaint. Mm. Now, we've all called into call centres before. I know I have, and I'm sure you did before you became a call centre worker. How has your view changed since you were a caller to now working in the call centre? Well, I just thought that call centres would just be full of young people, you know, like young students. Mm. And I just assumed that call centre work would be an in betweeny type of job. And, you know, because when I was at school in Hull, I never sat there and I thought, do you know what I want to be when I leave school? A call centre worker. <laughs> so <laughs> I just thought it'd be a, a stepping stone, but it isn't. I mean, you've got people that work there that they've got master degrees, doctorates, people like myself. You know, I've got a teaching qualification. But then you've got other types of people, the artistic types, you know, again, like myself, who mm -hmm. are into music and other life stuff. Uh, musicians that just can't make a living from it. Mm. It's, it is really quite a rich, well, a rich soup of people compared to what I thought it would be. Mm. But then you've got the other types of people, you know, the ones that have been there for years, know everything. 
you know, we'll probably stay there because they've only got a few years left. And what have you learned about the callers? Well, I used to work in mental health and I just thought that the callers, the general public, would be quite reasonable. But actually having worked with people who've got schizophrenia or bipolar, they are actually more reasonable than the general public. I oh know, like the general public have these huge expectations as opposed to what reality can actually really offer. They just, they just think that a company that makes lots of money, you know, has all the latest technology and has a really kind of modern infrastructure won't make mistakes. But that's that's not the reality at all. You know, one of the systems I work with is actually looks like CFAX. I know, oh God, it's that old. <laughs> Now we were having a, a bit of a chat before the interview, and you and we discussed about what rampant consumerism you might see yeah. and witness uh, in your day to day life. I mean, can you can you explain this a little bit more? Well, like I said, I worked in mental health, and um, say for example, somebody can't get hold of a certain drug that stops them from hearing voices in the head. Now, if say a local chemist in the surrounding area can't supply that drug to that person then that person will probably get really scared mm. and they'll probably really angry and you know because they need those drugs but mascara <laughs> you know, it's like i need my mascara i need it for saturday night and then i just think is that the end of the world i don't think it is individuals being horrible i just think that some people just have a smaller threshold of what they can cope with. Mm. So that person that's on the phone to me, or screaming down the phone at me because the mascara isn't there, is probably just overloaded. You know, she's probably worried about a job, she might not be able to make the mortgage that month, and, you know, just, and then got, her mascara doesn't turn up. You know, people just channel the feelings, and, you know... <laughs> well, can't you just suggest an alternative mascara? Oh. No, no. If if they order Doriel and it's not available, I can't say to him, have you tried Bonjour? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how you say it. Um, because, you know, oh, actually, actually, I might put that forward as a suggestion to my supervisor. Yeah, yeah probably just get laughed at again, though. Um, well, can you tell us a little bit more about some of your other frustrations with the job? Yeah, sometimes people phone up and they are total idiots. But you, you can't tell them that. Oh, you're not allowed to cancel them either. I mean, so for example, someone might have ordered next day delivery. And fair enough, they should get the purchase the next day. But sometimes they don't, you know, and I can't magically make it turn up for them. Mm. So they phone up and they complain. And, you know, that that's okay. But, you know, I, I, there's not much I can do about that. I mean, I can... Um, send you a replacement or find out where the delivery is give you another time of delivery but I can't make it turn up you know, and that's what people want so or for example we might be out of stock of a certain product and you know it's just not available people just think there is an endless supply of things and there isn't but what satisfaction do you get from working as a call centre worker oh little actually genuinely very little but they do have free Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But seriously, it is stressful, but it's not challenging. Mm. And I wish it was. There's a lot of pressure on you to get it right first time. I mean, at the end of the day, you just don't feel you're doing anything valuable or, or making a contribution. Mm. I just, I don't feel it's personal either. You know, I mean, I mean, anyone could be answering the phone and doing just as good a job as I could. I mean, you never really get any better at this job. Mm. You just learn how to back down quicker. You know, it's not worth fighting with people over it. You might as well just give them what they want and let them get on with it. And can I just add that working here is really not my confidence. You feel like you just slid down the bottom of the barrel. I mean, what I have to offer the working world is just not been taken up. You know, I feel like working in a call centre, you've failed. And that just does not feel good at all. Hmm. Well, let me just uh, read you a quotation. Uh, the worker feels himself at home only outside his work and feels absent from himself in his work. Uh, he feels at home when he is not working and not at home when he is working. His work is not freely consented to, but is a constrained, forced labour. 
Uh, work is thus not a satisfaction of a need, but only a means to satisfy needs outside of work. Does that describe you? Yeah, yeah, it does. I really like that quote. I'm basically working just to put food on the table and keep a roof over my head. That's the only real purpose of work. I mean, work doesn't feed me, it's not feeding my soul. I'm fed by the things that I do out, outside of work, like the creative projects I'm involved in. Mm. It's, just, it's just a practical way of not starving. Mm. <laughs> That's really bleak, isn't it? <laughs> How much control do you have over your work life? Oh, very little. But compared to a lot of workplaces, it's actually not that bad. I mean, I can book annual leave myself on the computer if it's, if it's available. I mean, I don't need permission. Um, I mean, recently I had to see a doctor because I hurt myself and I didn't need to use annual leave for that. Hmm. Uh, I think most every workplace should offer that. Mm -hmm. But mind you, I mean, I don't often get two days off in a row, so it's really hard to leave the local area or go very far. Hmm. And how much control do you have over your job? I mean, let's say the same problem keeps coming up again and again and, and, and you have an idea, you know, and you think, what a stupid way to do things. Mm. This is what should be done. There is a better way. Can you just take that to your supervisor? Well, you are encouraged to speak to your supervisors about these things, but then nothing really happens. Mm. So we have, when we have meetings, which we call huddles, um, we've brought up the fact that loads of emails from customers end up in this like catch-all pot um, that we can't access because of a problem with the computer system. The management know this and I've actually known about this since I've worked there but they don't do anything about it. So when you have a really angry customer that phones up demanding an answer to their email, I mean we can't tell them that we can't access that because we have a problem with the computer system. So you end up kind of skirting around the problem and you're like, you're like a politician, you know? <laughs> so you have to say stuff like, I am so, so sorry. Well, we've never had that problem before. I mean, I will certainly look into that. I mean, you know, it doesn't impact the management. It, it impacts us. Mm. Mm. Would you say that what you're doing is socially necessary or socially valuable work? Um, no, actually, I think my work in life contributes to making life worse. Um, I know, I know, let me explain. So this is the way that customer services works in this country. If you kick up a fuss, if you bully, if you're unreasonable, you get something. If you're nice and reasonable um, and pleasant, you get nothing. So, I mean, the whole system just rewards people that act unreasonably. Mm. So the companies, they don't want bad publicity, you know, especially on social media. Mm. So they'll pay out thousands and thousands of pounds for people that make ridiculous claims. So, you know, and that's why people um, make ridiculous claims to us, you know, when they phone up customer services. It just teaches bad values. Can you give us some examples? Well, I had a woman on the phone the other day She'd gone into one of our stores and she'd bumped into the side of an aisle and knocked off some nail varnish onto her £350 boots. <laughs> right. So she wiped off the nail varnish and her boots were fine. But she wanted us to compensate her because she had acted clumsily in one of our stores. So to be completely honest, I now know the way that this compensation culture works. I, I recently did the same thing in Sainsbury's gone in the store, bought some hair dye, um, but it had burst in the bag. I mean, no real problem, but I knew how to act. I knew there would be something on offer. And we got into a pretty sad state of affairs, you know. If people were paid a decent wage or felt secure in their jobs, you know, perhaps it wouldn't happen or happen as much as it does now. Mm -hmm. Are you afraid about becoming unemployed? Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, they're in charge of that. You know, they could drop you at any minute. You know, I mean, we've just been outsourced and they're selling us off. Now, if you don't mind me saying, you're 43 years old. Uh, what did you do before you were a call centre worker? I, well, I used to work in mental health and I was a supply teacher hmm. and um, used to have rolling contracts and I tried to keep them rolling, but I couldn't. So unfortunately, I ended up homeless for 18 months on surf sofa surfing while I tried to keep on with my teaching career 
couldn't. So, you know, I, I know how close you are to living that way. And I just, I really wouldn't want to go back to that life. But would you like to go back to teaching? Yeah, yeah, I would actually. I really enjoyed it. But I mean, these, I mean, permanent contracts just aren't permanent anymore. Like um, two year contracts got reduced down to one year. Mm. And then it was just basically you were self employed. So it was like having a zero hours teaching contract. So I'd have working for two weeks in one place and then I'd be out of work for some weeks. You know, I, I mean, you shouldn't have to be a teacher with a teaching qualification and borrow money off your mum so you can eat. You know, that's just not okay. I mean, I was all over. I was teaching skills in Skegness, Leicester, Lincoln, um, but, you know, the agencies just wouldn't pay for my invoices, for my work or for my travel. So I ended up, you know, basically on about 10 grand a year. Yeah, I know. So, you know, I mean, to be honest, I can basically make more money on a virtually minimum wage contract in a call centre than I can do teaching. So what about your own future and the future of the young people you work with? Oh, I am afraid that some of the younger people these days live in a little bit of a bubble. Mm. And they're always going on about what they're going to do when they retire. And I'm just like, you're never going to retire. You know, it's like, unless unless we change the political landscape in this country, and that is desperately needed, you are not going to retire. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? My mum's retired, my dad's retired. And I'm like, yeah, do you know what? Retirement's done. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the young kids that are at university, you know, these days, they're just, they're just not going to get a permanent job. And, you know, some of them aren't going to get on the housing ladder. It's, it's just not going to happen, you know. And, and as for me, well, I'm not going to be here in five years' time. I, ju I, I just won't be. Because to me, that would be like, I've given up on ever having a decent career. You know, I want to get more into the arts. I've just written a musical. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, I, I just think that art should be valued just as much as algebra. And unfortunately, it isn't. Well, thank you very much. Good luck with the new musical. Thank you. And thank you for being interviewed.